Hi everyone, my name is Aubrey Schmally. I'm the owner of Sensational Achievements and creator of the Body Activated Learning Framework. So last week on Facebook Live, we started our dyspraxia series uh, to talk about the different elements of praxis and how they can impact learning and performance in the school environment. Remember, praxis is your ability to identify and come up with ideas of what to do with your body and objects in the environment put together a plan or sequence of actions to execute and to execute on your plan. So ideation, planning and sequencing, and execution. Now, today we're going to be focusing on planning and sequencing. Planning and sequencing is different than planning and sequencing that you think of when we're talking about executive function because planning and sequencing your body movements or planning and sequencing in real time and space is really dependent on your ability to move your body efficiently and your ability to navigate space efficiently. Whereas when we're thinking about executive functions of planning an organization, we're really talking about long range planning, really sort of organizing and managing your time and breaking down projects, things like that. Um, where we're involving a lot more higher level cognitive processes. The other thing to keep in mind when it comes to praxis is that planning and sequencing is usually somewhere around the three the three step mark before you start engaging some of those higher cognitive functions. So that means the kids that we know that can only do one step or two steps or are bouncing out around the room starting a bunch of ideas but never finishing anything, they're the ones that we're targeting that may have a dyspraxia that then is the foundation that needs to be built so that they can develop more of those executive functions that are going to lead to to more independent learning and independent task completion. So let's uh, continue and um, talk a little bit more about the different types of planning and sequencing. So first, let's focus on your body. When you need to plan and sequence motor movements, that's going to involve being able to follow someone's directions to translate that into a plan for your body being able to imitate someone else's motor actions from demonstrations, or being able to self-generate that motor plan when someone is not giving you a demonstration or giving you specific verbal directions on how to execute that motor plan. So look and see, there might be different reasons that the child um, is having praxis problems and their behaviors are going to be different. If they're overly dependent on the verbal directions to figure things out, then the goal is really to fade back on those directions and increase their ability to self-generate that plan for their body. If they can't follow a visual demonstration, it doesn't matter how many times you show them until they have a physical experience with the movement, they're not going to be able to motor plan it, and they're also not going to be able to then string together more than one motor plan to make a sequence. So for example, if a child has challenges with writing, they might have difficulty motor planning the steps to putting the lines together to make a shape. And then it becomes much more complex for them to access multiple motor plans to take each letter that they learned and form a word or form a sentence. So you can see how praxis can be very, um, involve some basic motor planning skills, but then also a reliance on the ability to take those motor plans and string them together into a sequence so that your goals um, and your output becomes infinitely more complex. So when you're starting with a body-based sequential praxis deficit, we may be starting at one step and getting that child's body to move very efficiently and then asking them to switch back and forth in a two-step activity between two separate body motor plans. First jump and then clap. First climb and then crawl. Um, first spin and then leap. 
And then once we get those two steps down, then we'll be able to add on to do three or more steps in a sequence and maybe even think about getting some basic routines. So in the classroom, this might be a challenge for a child who's trying to follow a video-based movement break but can't translate that into a plan for their body fast enough or maybe you picked three different movements that you're gonna use during your wiggle break, but you went too fast, so the child needs four and five repetitions to really internalize the plan and move efficiently between those different motor plans to execute the sequence. So the first couple rounds, they might seem very disorganized, off task, always one step behind the other child and need more time, more repetition, more feedback to their body so that they can develop more efficiency in their motor movements. So that body-based sequ sequencing praxis deficit is most common with children who have a somatodyspraxia. Now, if you have a vestibular-based praxis issue, then you're going to have challenges sequencing activities in space. So that means that you might be jumping from one piece of equipment to the next, but you don't really see how objects fit together in the environment or how to navigate space to collect the materials that you need to execute a given task. So when we see a child who has a more vestibular-based praxis deficit, it's going to impact that spatial navigation, gathering of materials, and stringing together sequences that require them to move through the environment. The way that we would work on this in an OT session would be to start with all those um, objects very close together so that they start to see a relationship between um, the two steps that they're, that they're executing in space. And then as they're able to start connecting objects in space will increase the distance between the materials, um, still keeping it linear. And then once that becomes a, an easy thing for the child, then we're gonna start thinking about circular sequences or zigzags or having them go to different places in the environment that aren't imme immediately right in front of the child so that they can start to develop a more dynamic relationship with space when they're trying to plan and sequence how they're going to approach navigating their environment. So really think about what type of sequencing practice deficit you might be looking at because that's going to really change the type of intervention that you're going to do for a child who has trouble with sequencing practice. Now, in the classroom environment, it mostly shows up as difficulty executing morning routines, gathering the materials you need to get started with an activity, um, and being able to effectively manage transitions and you know have a spatial map in your head so that you know how to get from point A to point B. So it's very useful to use the picture schedules, um, the visual checklist, all of those executive function strategies do help, but they don't build that spatial map so that the child can develop more and more independence and hold on to a plan of what they need to execute. So be mindful of that so that you can help them plan and be ready for the transition to middle school when they're going to have to be doing more and more on their own and manage themselves in a much larger, busier environment that has a lot more unpredictability and a lot more independent expectations. So things that you can do, again, is maybe just work on them managing their materials in their immediate space to set up for the activity and then working on managing materials, maybe just in the cubby area, putting things in different spots, getting spatially oriented before you then ask them to sequence the cubby management, managing their codes, going back to their desk, getting their materials and getting started for the day. Because that's a higher level expectation that involves a lot of materials, navigating space, navigating the unpredictable children in that space and holding on to your plan all at once. 
Um, other ideas is really giving them specific things that they need to look for at each transitional point that gives them a goal for them to focus on until that spatial awareness starts to improve. And then this way you're giving them some sort of visual cue or um, highly reinforcing object that they need to scan the environment for that's going to help them get from point A to point B until we fade the, those objects and expect that they complete a larger portion of of the sequence before they get to the goal or the desired material. So those are some ideas of ways that you can work on sequencing praxis. Uh, a lot of times if you have a child with autism, you may have both of these things going on. You have trouble just with sequencing in space, but you also have trouble sequencing body movements. So think about if you've written goals that involve imitation or um, following instructions for motor plans, if the child has dyspraxia, this might be very, very challenging for them. And you don't want to make them just reliant on the picture cues. You want to really increase the tactile feedback to their body so they understand which body parts to use to motor plan the movement. And you want to make sure that you're trying to fade those visual supports over time so that you get the actual idea of the motor movement and a motor intention to help them execute the plan more consistently, see, more consistently, more independently, and generalize the skills so that they can do it in the absence of the picture cues or the visual demonstration um, from the BCBA or um, the person that's implementing the protocol for the intervention. So that gives you a pretty good sense of some of the different types of sequencing praxis deficits that you might um, encounter in the school environment um, and with children who have dyspraxia, even if they're very, very smart, they might just not be able to manage space, manage their body, and really do things in very backwards or awkward ways that make them appear distracted and incapable when really it's not that they're not smart, it's that their bodies are working against them rather than for them to engage in more goal-directed behavior in the classroom. So continue to stick with us for the third part of our series when we talk about execution and how execution deficits really can hinder the development of ideation, planning, and sequencing in the process and what you might need to do to support children who have those execution deficits at the foundation. If you don't want to wait until next week, you can definitely visit our website. I will give you the link in the comments below the video so that you can um, read more about dyspraxia on our Sensational Achievements website. There's also clickable links to different resources um, and other organizations that really deal specifically uh, with helping and supporting children with dyspraxia. So take a look at all of those. And then in our third part of our series next week, I am going to be giving you access to a Praxis resource that you can download and you can share uh, with the people on your child's team. So join us next week for our Facebook Live presentation. Hopefully um, our technical problems will be ironed out and you won't just see a recording of this video like you are today. Uh, again, my name is Aubrey Schmally. I'm the owner of Sensational Achievements and creator of the Body Activated Learning Framework. Enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully your back to school transition went smoothly. Have a great day.